Hello everyone. Good afternoon from Manila. Good evening and good morning for all of our viewers from all around the globe as well. We welcome you this afternoon uh, to our webinar where we will talk about the theme and now let's build together resilient democracies. This webinar is part of a series of online debates to design the future of social democracy. This webinar and series of workshops is also part and organized, uh, brought to you by the Progressive Alliance, the Network of Social Democracy in Asia, Global Progressive Forum, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, and of course, Akbayan Citizens Action Party from the Philippines. Good afternoon again. I am Rafaela David, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. And all the participants, a very good morning, good afternoon, and of course, good evening to all my dear congrats. On behalf of the steering committee of South Bay Asia, I would like to welcome all the participants in the meeting for joining us from Europe and also the Pacific. The topic that we are going to discuss today, Let's Build Together Resilient Democracy, is no doubt a very important one. Democracy around the world are under pressure. The economic and social political performance of democracy has been challenged by the right wing populist movement and the mismanagement of several global crises. And it is my privilege to be, to be given this opportunity to share with you my experience in Malaysia. Malaysia, since its independence in 1957, was under the ruling of Barisa National or National Front until it was ousted by a coalition of four parties, i.e. Pakatan Harapat, or we call it Alliance of Hope, in May 20, uh, 2020, 2018, in which my party, Democratic Action uh, Party Malaysia, is a party, is a party of the coalition. Alliance of Hope rose after six decades of one-party rule, and we were able to institute several political and economic reforms. For example, please connect. Okay, uh, I will continue. However, many of the reform agenda uh, are not fully completed, as PH government or the uh, government of Alliance of Hope was ousted by Perikata National Alliance in March 2020. The fall of Alliance of Hope was caused by mainly two factors. The internal fighting between the president of People's Justice Party, Anwar Ibrahim, and his deputy ten members of parliament quit from People's Justice Party, and ten of them joined, for, joined the National Alliance. One remained independent MP until today. At the same time, many in Malaysia United Indigenous Party, or we call it uh, Bersatu, see no future with Alliance of Hope. Therefore, the party formed the then Pakat. Uh, the party, therefore, the, the party decided to leave Pakatan uh, Alliance of Hope and formed Alliance of uh, National Alliance with the component parties from Barisan National, uh, that is National Front, and also Malaysia Islamic Party. However, having said that, uh, National uh, National Alliance is not a very stable government. On 4th of June 2020, Deputy Work Minister from Bersatu resigned from his position, calling the decision to join Perikata National Government incorrect and adding that he should have considered his constituents who vote for Alliance of Hope in 2018. In December 2020, AMNO MP Tungu Razali refused to support the federal budget and on January uh, 9th of 2021, Kelantan M AMNO MP, uh, Ahmad Zazlan Yaakob, withdrew his support for the Prime Minister, Muhyiddin Yassin. And many AMNO MP has made the same indication that include Nazir Razak, the sixth Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, also the well-known catocrat, Zahid Hamidi, the uh, President of AMNO, and many of their loyalists in AMNO itself. So it is a big question mark as to whether Muhyiddin Yassin still has the majority in Parliament to hold on to power. In order to avoid to be proven that he has lost majority, Malaysia well, it was placed under a state of emergency in January this year. However, uh, the ruler of the country has indicated that the emergency uh, will not be extended and will be lifted on August 1st. But we still don't know what will happen when parliament reconvenes. Because even though it seems that Muhyiddin Yassin has lost his majority, it is unclear if Anwar Ibrahim, PM candidate of Alliance of Hope, has command majority in order to form government. So what can we learn from the past and what can we expect for the future in Malaysia? 
Uh, in my opinion, formation of alliance and coalition should be based on common agenda and framework. And it is very important to ensure that all the component parties understand what the common agenda and framework is. Book of Hope was the manifesto of Alliance of Hope. However, because the drafting of the manifesto only involves selected few, not all members from the coalition understood the content. As a result, we face certain resistance when we try to deliver certain promises made under the manifesto. And now, due to the fact that no one has clear majority in the parliament, certain quarters are talking about the possibility to have a unity government in Malaysia. To be very frank, I think the chances of having a unity government is slim, is very, very slim. As you can imagine, none of us from the Alliance of Hope or for Democratic Extra Party will want to work with the tra traitors and also the credit caps. However, if we have to do the impossible, because we cannot afford to dissolve parliament, uh, we cannot afford to call for general election, because Malaysia is currently facing COVID-19 pandemic, like your country, and our situation, the if eventually we need to form a unity government in Malaysia, again, it must be guided with clear time frame and also agenda. I would say that unstable democracies in Asia are quite the norm rather than the exception. Many governments are using COVID-19 pandemic to close the democratic space. However, we must not despair and must make use of this opportunity to promote the idea of social justice and equity. This will help the progressive to shape the alternative to help build bad democracy in a way that safeguards institutions and people's will and participation. The ideology of social justice is particularly important during this COVID-19 pandemic. As no one is safe, until everyone is safe and no country is safe until every country is safe. To me, social justice and equity is the only answer to vaccine distribution and also healthcare disparity. In a country where people are taking their own lives due to hopelessness and despair, DAP My Party continues to work the talk by organizing mass testing, food basket delivery, fetching the elderly, the pregnant, the disabled to vaccination center, even though we are now in opposition. We believe that we need to continue to empower the people, especially the youth and the women, because they will be our biggest investment for a better future. Last but not least, I want to message this. Merci. I don't think there is a more pertinent time than now to discuss how best we can build more resilient democracies especially in light of a global health and economic crisis that has gravely affected the people we want to serve. These debates are timely and relevant for the region, not only because the crisis of democracy is most apparent in many countries in Asia, but also because we are in a period where regional and global progressive politics must be consolidated during this time as we build the new better normal. A concrete way for democracy to become more resilient in the Philippines and beyond is to regularly encourage more and more citizens to participate from joining strikes to sending a letter to your local official in our democracy. We must intensify our organization efforts. We must be able to campaign for democracy time and time again and reintroduce it in ways that will be understood by the majority of our people. Democracy as a political system, a sort of political faith is hardly in the minds of those people who have to find a way home when lockdowns start, or the fathers and mothers who violate quarantine rules to find food for their family. We must be able to build a democracy where these people, our citizens, have an equal share of power, have an equal share of voice on how our democracies should be run. Building resilient democracies, I hope, captures our pathway to bringing back the human rights discourse and the reorientation of power during this period. Resilient refers to the strength of our institutions and democratic values as a society in the face of major disruptions and crises. 
power reorientation to make democracies resilient is not only a national, but also a transnational and global agenda. Populists and authoritarians argue that these issues are domestic, dissent, media, security, organized crime. We disagree with this strongly. When domestic attacks against freedom fighters and Democrats are increasing, solidarity demands us to take these issues beyond the national borders. We affirm multilateralism. Again, here is where we strongly disagree with authoritarian populists. With this in mind, we need to engage multilateral institutions and utilize international instruments of accountability. We are looking forward to the investigation of the International Criminal Court on the war on drugs in the Philippines. We are studying the Magnitsky Acts in the US and Europe under which human rights violators will be made to account by our international community. We also need to come together to fight against international bullies. China, for instance, has not wavered in her desire to control territories and threaten the hard-won peace and stability in the region. The Philippines has sovereign rights over the West Philippine Sea, and we will never stop declaring it to the world because not only do we have the 2016 arbitral award in our arsenal, a landmark legal decision in international law, but we also have the support of nations that respect a rules-based order. We should stand shoulder to shoulder to stand up to such bullies and tell them that we will not cower. There are more challenges ahead of us, but in the face of these difficulties, how do we overcome them and to make our democracies resilient? I invite you to the debate to discuss the pathways to strengthen political actors and institutions to shape the discourse against the dominant state in the region where democracy is constantly undermined. Lastly, democracies are resilient when democracy-loving citizens are. I hope we also discuss ways to encourage more young people to be partners in this effort and the reform of our parties to take up these challenges. Let us link arms with democratic and progressive parties to defend democracies and together tilt the balance of power that will make our democracies and peoples more resilient than we have ever been before. Thank you. Um, well, it's good afternoon here in my time and probably good morning in, in Berlin. Um, so um, when, we, when we start this word resilience, I guess uh, I have to really mention our experience of, to, uh, of a party being resilient in the context of Thai authoritarianism in not just in politics, but also in daily life, what we are actually facing. Um, as you all know, we found we founded Future Forward Party in March 2018. And in February 2020, we were dissolved as a political party. Uh, we came as number three party in, in our first election in Thai parliament. My term in parliament was 11 months but we what what we were trying to do was that our slogan says everything and and it was really clear that the future we aspire to is the future where the ultimate power truly belongs to the people and that goes against what the military junta has been trying uh to nurture um here in thailand um 
I, I guess first thing I have to talk about the structural um, fight against the authoritarianism and um, to really change the structure is something that we have to really strategically um, plan and also uh, make sure that the public awareness is there. With the structure, I mean, especially in political structure, um, with Thai political system and structure being distorted by the military at the moment, for example, uh, Future Forward Party being dissolved by constitutional court, uh, or the very, very weird formula of calculating the number of member of parliament by the election commission in Thailand. This makes Thai people basically lose faith in the parliamentary process. And what I mentioned, which is the beginning of the whole, uh, the whole uh, structural changes that has been implemented by the military. So it is really important that the public awareness is there because at the beginning when we were, ha uh, when we were uh, having the Future Forward Party, the public awareness of this was not that high. And now, um, and now as progressive movement, after the party was being dissolved, uh, 50 plus something of our MPs go to uh, another political party that they found. Um, and us, the executive committees who face 10 years ban from politics, are now trying to um, really stand up and still keep on raising the awareness and what we are doing. So we're, campaign, we're campaigning uh, to amend the constitution, making sure that the Senate who currently, uh, you know, 250 seats in the parliament, uh, they are basically the hands of the military junta. Um, they have the power to vote uh, for the uh, for the prime minister and also other important decisions in the parliament as well. Uh, we try to make sure that this mechanism in the constitution in the next constitution draft will not exist. And what we are doing right now, we achieve over one hundred thousand names during the the COVID time in less than a week. So. What, from our experience within this, uh, the situation of Thailand, the public awareness is the key. And we're not just limited to, um, to uh, creating the public awareness through the normal channel. We use all the networks in different places that we have, the youth networks and also uh, the social media. Um, in, in fighting and making sure that uh, the resilience is there in the process. We launch many small projects to make sure that voices are heard and make sure that people still see the parliamentary process as a functional process. I think this is the key to keep um, the democratic process running in a country where authoritarianism, I don't want to say this word, but I think at least in Thailand at the moment, it's really uh, flourishes at the moment. Um, and in this, when the uh, public awareness is small, we realized that the military junta started to slow down many decisions. Of course, there are, there are decisions that uh, we cannot really um, go against, but there are uh, pressure that we could create at this moment uh, through the public awareness, through uh, the civic movement, uh, even though it has been extremely difficult due to the COVID situation and due to even more uh, stronger and severe uses of laws like the Les Majeste Law 112 or the crim other criminal code and also the Computer Crime Acts in Thailand. These laws have been used against media and also individuals in Thailand, making sure that they are silent at this point. Um, 
So in this regard, um, what we are doing at the moment is that uh, we make sure that the stories of the people who face or who face these charges are uh, published and are become the awareness and become the social agenda of the society that people start to have more understanding of these laws. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, in Thailand, people still look, some people still look at these laws as laws. Um, they tend not to really question the uses of these laws and the interpretation of these laws and, and so forth. And so we were trying to make sure that the understanding is raised and people become um, more understanding in this. But I guess the last point of the resilience that I would like to really point out is extremely important. And this is long-term process. Um, for, for Thailand, we are now in the era where even the Education Act, the National Education Act is being influenced heavily by the military. It was clearly written in this current draft that it cannot go against the 20 years strategic plan that set forth by the military. The civic education has been basically um, basically silenced and can only follow the military path. To me, the civic education, not just for Thailand, but also to raise the understanding of civilians across Southeast Asia in issues that we share is extremely important. And these are something that we have to do as a network. Um, as educator myself, I realized that uh, we still tend to have a civic education uh, only focusing on the issues of one country where indeed it should be, um, it should be more on regional level. It should discuss more on the cooperation uh, of each country in different issues in politics, in um, refugees, um, in global climate. Well, in Southeast Asia, you know, we have the issues of uh, the PM 2.5 it should be there and it should be done in the, in the same way across, um, across uh, the region. Um, this is uh, the foundation that I would like to point out. However, I think my time is running out soon, right? Um, one last thing that I'd like to mention, um, if I have more time, I would elaborate on this, is that the fact that Thailand and Myanmar has been really close together in many ways. Uh, our generals are really close uh, on you know, national, international level and also at personal level. Uh, one concern that I'd like to raise is that this model of authoritarianism will become contagious to other parts of the region. And Thailand actually should take part of being the leading role, but of course we cannot do it as uh, the military junta is now running the country, but it should be the case that the ASEAN um, community should join force and make sure that the stability of this region um, is founded by uh, the members of the country in this region and making sure that the, the seeds of authoritarianism will not be spread. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to all, the, all my fellow panelists, as well as uh, all people from around the world who are participating in this uh, webinar today. I'll keep my remarks uh, as short as possible. The world uh, has gone through a fairly traumatic time over the past 18 months. Nations, businesses, people have been uh, very severely impacted by this uh, global pandemic called COVID-19. Uh, unfortunately, if you were to 
rewind back to the genesis of COVID-19 in the November, December of 2019 and the subsequent uh, developments in January 2020, one thing which comes out very clearly is that uh, the global institution entrusted with the task of ensuring information dissemination and coordination when it comes to global health issues, namely the World Health Organization, was found to be severely wanting. Uh, the, the initial uh, advisories which came out of the World Health Organization, perhaps because of a lack of information or a lack of appreciation of the seriousness of COVID-19, uh, seemed to suggest that uh, everything was okay and people did not need to be really concerned, which turned out to be uh, absolutely a case of uh, instilling a false security in a populace uh, which could have otherwise possibly guarded themselves a little more better and uh, may have uh, escaped the initial uh, onslaught of the pandemic. Coupled with that, uh, you saw the strain specter of the United Nations Security Council not being able to discuss the spread of the pandemic in the March and April of 2020. It's only when the presidency of the United Nations Security Council changed that there was uh, a, a discussion, an un unsubstantive discussion on the origin and proliferation of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Unfortunately, the global response, the global coordination, uh, which should have really led this uh, entire effort to contain, combat and roll back uh, COVID-19 was extremely missing. Uh, what you really saw were nationalistic responses, sub-nationalistic responses, responses at the town, county, province, village level, uh, whereby uh, people and uh, local governments uh, took their own autonomous decisions, depending upon really what the situation was. And uh, for a country as vast as India, which has over 600,000 villages, uh, what we really saw in the first wave of the pandemic, that uh, each of those villages and in the and, and, and over 200, 250 cities uh, really uh, became uh, autonomous uh, response responders uh, for the lack of uh, a, a, a cohesive and a coordinated response at the national level, except for maybe the most uh, stringent and rigorous lockdown, which the world had, uh, uh, had, 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 had witnessed. As we moved from the first wave of COVID-19 to the second wave. Uh, unfortunately, uh, India took its eye off the board. Uh, the national government, even the people uh, thought, uh, contrary to all the empirical evidence which is available in the public space, going back to the Spanish flu, that a second wave would not come. And when the second wave hit us, it was extremely devastating. Uh, a large number of people unnecessarily died because of lack of oxygen, lack of uh, medical supplies. And it's not that oxygen and medical supplies were not available. It's just that the kind of logistical planning which should have taken place when there was a pause between the first and the second wave, uh, unfortunately did not happen. What uh, the pandemic has also exacerbated is the divide between the affluent, the middle classes, and of course the poor. And nothing evidences it more than the digital divide. As the world moved from uh, becoming physical to virtual, uh, people who are underprivileged, people who are poor, unfortunately who do not have access to those means of communication, the smartphones, the laptops and the iPads, especially school going children, uh, they were per perhaps the worst impacted in terms of their studies when compared to their peers. Even the uh, vaccination effort, uh, though there was uh, global coordination, you had the 
platforms uh, taking shape. You had the International Alliance come into being. Uh, but essentially, uh, empirical and scientific evidence with the required amount of integrity uh, is still not available. Every day, you see, uh, you see uh, conflicting reports with regard to when the second shot, the second jab should be taken, whether it is more efficacious after four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. You know, you can pick your number. Uh, there are reports that if you actually combine two different vaccines rather than sticking to the same one, uh, you possibly are better immunized. And even on the question of genome sequencing, because the manner in which variants uh, are emerging almost every 15 days, uh, there is a complete lack of clarity. So therefore, uh, the pandemic is really far from over. Our misery is really far from over. But the one thing which has come out very clearly is that the institutions of global governance that we had created uh, post the Second World War uh, have been completely and absolutely found wanting. And therefore, there is a need uh, for uh, Democrats around the world uh, to really apply their minds as to how do we re-engineer these institutions of global governance so that they can actually start serving the purpose for which they were conceived and created rather than being uh, uh, bloated global bureaucracies uh, not serving any purpose except possibly uh, their own well-being. And I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Payang. Uh, just, uh, just Bobby, just call me Bobby. Uh, I would like to begin with a very basic thing, just a sound check. Uh, can, can you hear me clearly? Okay, that's great. Yes, sir, Bobby. Um, yeah, I just prepared a few slides and I would, I would try to sh share, share them. Hope this will uh, work. Okay. <laughs> Can you see the, sli the first slide, title slide? Yes, yes. Okay, okay thank you. <clears throat> Good morning slash afternoon slash evening to everyone. I am grateful for being invited here and I would really appreciate the very rich discourse that will be emanating from this forum. I would like to begin by going down to the basics. What is resilient democracy or what makes democracy resilient? I hazard the following elements of resilience. One, human rights and civil liberties. Two, participative and deliberative democracy. That means going beyond elections. Three, strong institutions with checks and balances. Four, economic progress and equitable distribution of resources. Five, social services and welfare and human security. And six, opportunities for human development. I stress that none of these elements should be missing. Civil liberties and individual freedoms, for example, cannot be sacrificed in the altar of economic progress. Or human rights cannot be conceded in favor of human security. All these elements reinforce each other. Neglect one and the rest would fall like dominoes. Now, how does the Philippines fare? I sadly report that presently, we are an epic fail in, mil in millennial parlance in all these measures of resilient democracy. We have no time to go into details, but just to illustrate through example, our president Rodrigo Duterte in his State of the Nation address that declared that his concern is not human rights, is not for human rights, but, but for human lives. An obviously flawed, outrageous logic because those are not contradictory. His actions, however, show that he has no concern for either of those. He has concern for neither. He proved his lack of concern for human rights by jailing his critics, like Senator and former chair of the Commission on Human Rights, Laila de Lima. He demonstrated his disdain for human lives by declaring, Hitler massacred three million Jews. There's three million drug addicts. There are. I'd be happy to slaughter them. That is the president of our country speaking. These are just examples of an almost daily barrage of verbal and actual atrocity. An estimated 30,000 extrajudicial killings have been committed in a so-called war on drugs, far surpassing the EJK records 
of all his predecessors combined. The bigger atrocity is that many Filipinos continue to cheer him. He is like a national ch snake charmer, uh, a magician that has put a huge crowd under his spell. As human rights fall by the wayside, so do the rest of the elements of resilient democracy. Elections continue to be ruled by guns, goons, and gold. Congress and the courts are successively pressured, neutralized, and eventually controlled. Mass media continue to be gagged and manipulated, especially social media. Hunger, unemployment, and mass poverty escalate, especially in the wake of a bungled economic, uh, COVID response. Why are we stuck here? Or why are we back in this state? It is long and complicated. Just like many countries in the world, the Philippines has a colonial history. We often joke that we were under 400 years of Catholic Church colonization under Spain and 100 years of Hollywood. There, were, there was also the Japanese adventurism during the Second World War, and now, as a side note, Chinese expansionism in the South China Sea. Our country is so beautiful. We have so many aggressive suitors. These colonial incursions have fundamentally altered our society and were ultimately responsible for our current economic model with its huge wealth disparity, mass poverty, lack of industrial development, and oligarchic control over politics and economy. We also had an authoritarian legacy under former president and dictator Ferdinand Marcos. During his 14-year rule, when the country was under martial law, there was economic stagnation, world record corruption, an estimated $10 billion was stolen during the time of Marcos, stolen by Marcos. And that was an estimate uh, done by no less than the Guinness Book of World Records. And of course, widespread repression. Marcos was not only a, th a, a human rights violator, he was also a kleptocrat. And lastly, we had armed conflicts, a communist insurgency and uh, nationwide at the nationwide level and Muslim self-determination struggle in the South, and we still do. We managed to kick the tyrant from the country in 1986 and had a chance to reboot the system, so to speak, to build, re to build resilient democracy. And to a certain extent, uh, we have succeeded. There were institutional reforms, like we had a new constitution with robust human rights provisions, asserted civilian supremacy over the military, check and balance, freed media from government control. We filed cases in court against Marcos's criminal acts. We tried to recover the wealth stolen by Marcos through the PCGG. We came up with a reparation program for the victims of martial law, and we negotiated with the rebel groups. These were important transitional justice mechanisms, but there have been gaps. There was lack of punitive action. No perpetrator has been jailed. Lack of lustration. Violators were still able to run in elections and win. Armed conflicts unresolved. Inequality and poverty remain. And lastly, the mar martial law lessons are lost. They weren't included in the education curriculum. That's why the young ones were not able to learn the hard lessons of martial law. In short, post-Marcos Philippines was not exactly a brand new model, but simply a reset to factory settings. We just returned the country to the democratic order prior to martial law, but it was not transformative enough in the sense of resilient democracy as we understand it. Now, the armed conflicts remain unresolved. The peace process with the Muslim rebels have reached, uh, well, significant progress, but the, the communist insurgency rages on. And most significantly, our country seems to be back to square one under Duterte. He was elevated to power on the strength of right-wing populism that seems to be the growing global trend. Duterte brings back authoritarian rule that seems to carbon copy Marcos's playbook. He doesn't even hide his admiration for the dictator. And lastly, violent extremism is on the rise. This is the challenge we face as a country in Asia that has been the first to show how people's power can change society. We need to find a way to stop the backslide to tyranny. We need full transitional justice. We need to continue this people-powered 
democratization process, this, uh, this process towards building resilient democracy. And we are not alone in the Philippines. We have this solidarity and we need to find ways of helping each other. Thank you very much. Apologies to my fellow panelists, but uh, since in my, uh, I'm in my parliamentary constituency and things are not virtual here, things are physical, so therefore uh, there are certain commitments to be kept. I would have great enough to hear the views of uh, all the enlightened participants who have gathered here uh, for this webinar. All that I would like to say is that uh, the one thing which has come out very, very clearly over the past uh, 18 months, if not more, ever since we saw the rise of right-wing populism uh, across the world and uh, more as a reaction and a revolt uh, to globalization post the economic meltdown of 2008, uh, social democrats unfortunately have not been able to wrap their heads around a model uh, which can really uh, articulate and reflect the aspirations of people who feel left out or felt left out of this model, model of globalization, which held the field uh, from 1990 onwards till about 2008, uh, absolutely in an uninterrupted manner. In fact, uh, the neoliberal economic model for the lack of a better world, uh, almost for some represented quote unquote, the end of history, uh, but history never really ends. And so therefore, I think as we go forth, the real challenge is to find the middle ground to find uh, the center whereby uh, democracy can be combined or uh, social democracy can once again start reflecting the concerns of those who felt disempowered by this wave of globalization and integrate them into uh, the, 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 the mainstream. And that's really been the tragedy of uh, social democrats going back to the time when the world became unipolar because you had uh, a uh, neoliberal economic model. It went into the hands of the right-wing populace. And, and, and so therefore, uh, uh, what we require is a transformative vision uh, that can uh, really take into account these impulses and see if we can come up with a model, which of course will have to be customized uh, to the needs of every country, uh, uh, you know, which, which, which can actually work on the ground. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend uh, the, 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 the talk of uh, Mr. Mark Saxer yesterday, uh, who uh, is also a part of the FES and the Progressive Alliance, uh, where he presented his vision of, of a transformative democracy. And I think that's really the way to, for, for our, all of us to look that is the way to focus, because otherwise, uh, caught between these two extreme positions, uh, we will only uh, swing from marginalization to marginalization. Uh, those are my uh, few bits of uh, unsolicited wisdom, if I can put it in those words. And uh, if, of course, you are recording this uh, entire webinar, I would be uh, grateful if you could send me a link so that I could have the benefit of listening to all that I would miss uh, during this extremely stimulating session. Thank you very much, Manish, and uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts maybe on another time on what this uh, transformative vision or model looks like, especially as we try to also envision what re resilient democracy is for us in uh, in Asia. Um, now, like, we go to Kantida. Thank you again for uh, letting Manish go uh, first. And then um, we go back to our question again on um, how and which international actions, actors, and alliances do you think can support in strengthening a model of resilient democracy in our region. Thank you, Kuntida. Go ahead. Thank you, Flying. Um, hi again. Uh, I have four uh, aspects of these uh, very important question to, to share with you. Let me go first with, to me, well, as a linguist, as a teacher, and as someone who really cares about um, the sociocultural patterns of, of human beings. Uh, we have to really fight against the narratives of pro-militarism and also um, the authoritarianism that they are actually trying to create this normalcy of the, their um, ideology and, and also uh, the, all their right-wing populism. Um, I would like to point out um, some, some examples that, that uh, is quite important right now. Um, 
currently we are facing the COVID situation in, in every, every country. And if you look cl more closely to how the, um, the right-wing populace reacted to this, it goes back to the individuals um, that, you know, people are not careful enough, they, they don't take care of themselves, they just, um, they just, you know, um, want to live their normal life and they do not want to follow uh, the COVID-19 measures. That's why we ended up like this. Um, I guess this is something that we shared not in just one region, but uh, throughout the world. And with one voice, with, you know, one country talking about this, it may not be um, efficient enough um, we need to make sure that information and also the narratives that the government and also uh, the people who are taking care of, of uh, a country have to be responsible for this rather than you know having people looking at their individual responsibility but they have to look beyond that. Um, to me, this narrative is extremely important. For example, in Thailand, uh, the information like we have since the coup data in 2014 that um, the military junta uh, has been in power, we have more people committing suicide in number and it, it is increasing even more. The information like this was not even spread um, anywhere. Um, it was circulated in a very, very um, small um, uh, group of people or even, even larger um, and more grander uh, narratives that, uh, for example, Thailand and China, um, as you may know, that during the military junta regime, uh, we, Thailand, tend to lean forward uh, to China in many, many issues. Well, the infrastructure is one, the fruit industry is another, and also uh, during this COVID-19 situation, the vaccines, um, it is almost, uh, well, mainly, it is really China-based uh, uh, vaccines that we're using. Um, so these are something that happening, not in just one country, but it, it tends to be an issue that we only talk within the narratives of a nation, rather than this is a more in um, global or a regional um, uh, context. Um, so the narratives have to move to the regional, the global context when it comes to militarism, authoritarianism, or the right wing populists. Um, and this comes to my number two, where actually um, the authoritarianism, they exist not in just a political realm, but they also exist as in the capitalists, where they are heavily and um, really closely networked. And this, again, have to be uh, raised as an issue and also go to international laws and regulations, whether, um, for example, the boards of different organizations should have the military in the boards or not as the international um, commerce laws, for example. Um, so in order to, uh, to make sure that the network of authoritarianism doesn't go further than what they are now, we need us as a network also to propose international laws and regulations to make sure that their money doesn't grow, basically, just to stop their capitalism. For example, um, Thailand and Myanmar, as you know, uh, along the border, it is a, a, an extremely large industry we're talking about here. Um, so basically, the military has almost 100% control over uh, the business and, and the um, um, commerce there at the, at the, the border. So with you know um, eliminating the network, making sure that the network doesn't grow is one way that we can work together um, as uh, as interparliamentarians and also through other international organizations. The third one that um, the third issue that I would like to mention is uh, the ASEAN uh, takes on uh, being not being interfering with other. Um, countries, the no interference policy is something that we need to reconsider extremely 
um, extremely important. Uh, when issues or violence broke down in Myanmar, for example, um, it really needs the ASEAN leaders, other ASEAN leaders to shout out, to um, call for actions. Um, and it, it should be the role of the ASEAN leader since 1967 when it was founded because it definitely goes against the human rights violations. But again, of course, we see we see the reaction from um, many countries. But for example, in Thailand, the reaction from Thai leaders uh, was not there basically on, on this issue because of their close relation to the Myanmar uh, military. Uh, so the citizens and also the international community played an, a very, very important part in this um, to pressure the ASEAN leaders to keep the human rights and and uh, the violations of human rights away from the citizens. Uh, the last one that I would like to mention is there are successes in bringing in the third party mediators in peace process uh, in many countries in, uh, in Southeast Asia, in Aceh, in Indonesia, with the UN, for example, in Thailand, uh, the discussion between uh, the peace process between BRN uh, and the Thai government that took place in Kuala Lumpur uh, was quite um, a monumental uh, for the whole uh, peace processes because it, it happened first time in so many, many years. Um, and we realized that the third party mediators, something that should be recognized as important in uh, bringing in peace in the region and also to keep the uh, human rights um, ideology intact in the region. Um, yeah, so basically what I'm, I'm talking about starting from a, the very, very uh, basics of the narratives to the uh, structure of the international cooperation and even international um, third party mediators that could uh, help um, restoring democracy and making sure that democracy is here in the region. So these are my four uh, proposals. Hi, Heng. Uh, thanks to the previous speakers. Uh, hearing uh, the inputs of Contida and Manish, uh, I can say there are so many similar things. No? As, as you say in Thailand, same, same. Your problems, our problems in the Philippines, in India, in Malaysia, and elsewhere, we have so many uh, common things, and uh, we really have no choice but to work with each other. Uh, just like in the previous part, I have again uh, prepared a set of slides for, for this particular question. Uh, I'm sorry about that, if that makes my input a bit more uh, impersonal, but uh, when I'm speaking spontaneously, I tend to talk on and on. No? And uh, before I know it, uh, I have already exceeded my time. So my preparing slides is my way of uh, disciplining myself as well. So let me just share my uh, slide once again. Okay, is it, uh, can it be seen? So the question thrown by the organizers is how and which international actions, actors, and alliances can support strengthening a model of resilient democracy in your region. <clears throat> well, we all have our favorite issues and pet advocacies. I also have mine. I think, however, that in consideration of the myriad and interconnected problems that we face, these are the ones that demand the greatest attention and hold the biggest potential for mobilization. So the key issues and campaigns that I think uh, we should focus in on. One is human rights, transitional justice, and prevention of atrocity. In Asia, there are specific hotspots where human rights and democracy are seriously threatened. Philippines, Myanmar, Hong Kong, and as we hear from Kuntida earlier, also Thailand, Repressive measures and outright killings are happening at an alarming rate. So this, this set of issues is really paramount in my, in my view. Number two, obviously, pandemic. Undeniably, everyone is affected by COVID-19. 
but we are affected differently as elaborated by Manish earlier. Poorer countries and communities suffer the more severe impacts. There is already an oversupply of vaccines in certain advanced countries, but they have yet to reach the poorer ones. It is also particularly telling that governments with authoritarian leaders have poorer track records in pandemic response. The more repressive, the less effective COVID response. We see that in the Philippines under Duterte, Brazil under Bolsonaro, Bol Bolsonaro even the US when it was still under Trump, and so forth. The next issue is disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Typhoons are getting stronger and super typhoons are getting more frequent. It is no coincidence that the escalation of weather disturbances coincides with increased human activity. We can no longer deny the reality of climate change, though some continue to, den to deny it, especially those who stand to lose when they change their ways that lead to global warming. The next issue I think that uh, would that should hold our attention is hate speech, fake news, and social media manipulation. The computer has now become a far stronger weapon than arms, than actual arms. Who would have thought that Facebook can actually be weaponized and used to make people like Trump and Duterte become presidents? The internet and social media are great tools for communication and even education, but we need to get them back from those who create false reali realities for nefarious ends. Remember, sensational fake news spread faster than facts. We need to reclaim them. We need to reclaim YouTube. And number five, right-wing populism. Again, an, an obvious choice. We live in times when the salamanqueros rule the day. I use the word salamanquero. That's a Tagalog word. Uh, salamanqueros are the snake magicians in the Philippines. Those who perform magic tricks using a huge python. and um, uh, I've seen them uh, in the Philippines when they were performing. They're they really very good, no? They mesmerize the crowd with spectacles, misdirection, and a glib tongue. And at the end of the performance, manage to control their minds and do as they please. I've seen salamanqueros in action when I was a kid. They were very effective. I see them again now as an adult in national leaders, who capitalize on gut issues and use the crude language of ordinary people for empathy. They manage to win votes through mass hypnosis. They need to be neutralized. There are many other core issues, but in my book, these are the pressing ones. There are also existing networks and alliances around them. For human rights, for example, there is the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, APHR. There's also Forum Asia based in Bangkok, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, or GANRI, and its uh, South, Southeast Asian counterpart. For transitional justice and atrocity prevention, there is the Asia Justice and Rights, or AJAR, and the Asia pa Pacific Partnership for Atrocity Prevention, or APAP. For disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, the international NGOs would be very important partners like Oxfam, Save the Children, and PLAN. I can go on and on for the list is long. I have had opportunities to work with most of these organizations and networks, and I understand the importance of alliance building and coalition work, even among those with whom we do not fully agree. In summary, we need to focus our regional and global work and perform these tasks. One, intensify global pressure. Our problems are global. That's why our targets should be global as well. Enhance solidarity among peoples and progressive parties. That's an obvious action that we need to intensify. And three, study regional and global trends. Ensure that lessons are learned and imparted. The five issues that I have uh, um, enumerated earlier those are global trends. Those are not country specific issues. Populism is a global trend. Climate change affects all of us, hate speech, and so on and so forth. Let's continue studying their patterns, their patterns of movement and how we can best intervene as people who are working together and helping each other across the borders.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bobby, for identifying some of the key questions. Um, in Malaysia, we are, actually, we know in order to hit or in order to achieve herd immunity, um, any country must include refugees, stateless person into their uh, vaccination plan. And in, in Malaysia, we have a very unique situation whereby the minister in charge of the national vaccination plan uh, has declared it that they are going to include all the refugees, they are going to include even the illegal uh, uh, workers in Malaysia, and also a stateless person in Malaysia into the national vaccination plan. However, our home minister who in charge of national, who are in charge of who is in charge of national security, has been threatening to arrest those illegal workers and send them back home. So we have a very unique situation in Malaysia whereby in one hand, the minister in charge of the uh, vaccination plan has welcomed and urged all the stateless person, has urged all the refugees, has urged all the illegal workers to come out and to receive vaccines. However, uh, they, they, are not, they do not dare to come out simply because they worry that their action will be taken against them after they, they appear. So I think, generally speaking, we must understand all the country, all the government must understand in order to achieve herd immunities, we must be fair to all the refugees, that the person, and also illegal workers at this particular moment. This is not a time whereby government go and take harsh action against those illegal workers, uh, refugees, etc. Because the more we stare them, the more difficult they are going to appear, come out, step forward to receive vaccine, and eventually they will form non, they will be continue to spread virus in the community and then forming one cluster after another cluster. At least this is what happened in Malaysia now. So I think uh generally speaking, I think in fact in view of this COVID-19 pandemic, we must we as I mentioned just now, no one is safe until everyone is safe. No country is safe until every country is safe. And therefore everyone here must include refugees, illegal workers, careless individuals, etc. And we must put pressure to all the governments to include this particular category into their vaccination plan and then of course to receive them and then hopefully to have a better settlement for them etc so i think especially in view of this covid 19 pandemic i, I think this is very very crucial at the moment i think Kantina wants to share yeah uh, very briefly uh on a country like thailand that we have not signed the uh, 1951 refugee convention yet the international uh committee can really, you know, continue the effort to pressure the government to do it. This is a really long-term goal. Um, sadly mentioned that it, it is a, a long-term process for Thailand. Um, but again, we also need um, condemnation from international community in um, the management of the situation, especially the COVID-19. For example, in Thailand at the moment, uh, construction sites where um, workers, uh, both Thai and, and non-Thai, uh, were basically shut down because of the COVID situation. And it was very, very mysterious on their living condition at the moment. And this, it pretty much remained inside of the Thailand and, and uh, it, it was not, the news was not shared so much on the Thai, how Thai government uh, take care of the situation or manage the situation. So uh, currently many workers uh, in Bangkok, especially Bangkok, because the sites were shut down in Bangkok, uh, they left Bangkok to, to other provinces with, without any clear, uh, without any clear plan or you know, what they can do uh, as a living. Um, so their living standards is extremely in, um, in high concern and also uh, children living in these family are also uh, uh, very vulnerable at the moment. Uh, Payang, just to make a quick addition on that uh, topic, uh, I think it's important for us to understand and analyze deeply the different uh, causes of, of forced and mass evacuations that lead to uh, mass refugees. Uh, I can think of at, le at least three. One is uh, natural disasters, and that would entail a, a good and comprehensive disaster risk redu reduction program. Uh, another is wars and, and armed conflicts, both internal and external conflicts. Those are uh, much harder to address, but uh, attention should be focused on those who are unwittingly victimized by wars and armed conflicts. Uh, and the third is this is uh, more is harder to address, but should really uh, 
uh, be addressed seriously, and that is the question of discrimination and uh, xenophobia. We see that, for example, in the treatment uh, given towards the Rohingya. Uh, they are internally discriminated, and they were they are forced out of their territories. And uh, that's why Bangladesh, for example, has, has been generous enough to receive them. But that's just a temporary action. The the the, the, the more deep-seated problem of discrimination can should be seriously addressed in this regard. It became even more complicated with the coup d'état recently. Uh, but uh, that should that issue should still be part within our radar. Uh, thank you, Bobby, and to our uh, panelists. Uh, there's a follow-up question, which I think is actually very much uh, related to what you said, Bobby, about discrimination. Um, and of course, that includes what uh, Kajo from Greece said, uh, are there humanitarian aid intervention? But more importantly, are there programs to integrate them in society? In that sense, also make sure that th there is no discrimination. And I'd like to follow that up with a question of Julian, which I think is also important in this discussion. Um, Julian Gastello. Uh, who asks, how do you perceive polarization, uh, in that sense also othering and discrimination of other forces within your community? Uh, so how do you perceive polarization within your countries? May that be because of uh, ethnicity or other beliefs? In Europe as well as in the U.S., polarization has become very strong along identity politics, uh, largely because of migrant, migrant politics as well. No? Um, do you see common problems in Thailand and the Philippines? Um, so anyone can share their thoughts. Um, can, I, I'd like to share first because I have to leave for another meeting soon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Thailand is quite complex in that sense. Uh, we have currently, we are divided in, into basically two camps, um, the pro-military and pro-democratic. Uh, but within the two camps, uh, they're pretty much detailed in, in the two camps. You know, you're pro-military, do you support uh, the monarchy or not? Then, you know, you can also be pro-democracy and also pro-monarchy. So monarchy is another, another factor in, in the polarity uh, in Thailand, uh, to, to be very frank about this. Um, it is very alarming to my personal view to see the intensity of the polarization in, in Thai society. Um, it goes to a, a very, very much of the daily life activities. For example, uh, there are groups that said these are restaurants uh, for pro-military. These are places that you should go, you should not go. It, it reminds me of the segregation time in the US uh, back in the history. Uh, we're moving to that direction and it's quite um, alarming. Um, and I, I can see the direction to this issue that it will continue to the boiling point, um, the, break, the point where there must be something breaking down um, in the society, um, but it's, it is pretty much polarized and, and um, families, uh, even in families, uh, there are families uh, filing charges against people and their members of their family um, for Article 112, which is a really strong charge. And, and uh, they know that with this charge, where their family is heading to, it's very long jail term. Um, and the, the prosecution process is, is really long. Uh, so um, yeah, Thailand has to really discuss this openly and try to find um, some solution at least to mitigate or to um, lessen this, this problem. I'm afraid that it is extremely um, uh, concerning at this moment. Um, I would like to share the experience in Malaysia as well um, about the polarization. Uh, even though uh, Julia asked about Thailand and Philippines, I hope you don't mind that I share my experience in Malaysia as well. Actually, before Pakata Harapan or the Alliance of Hope, our government for in Malaysia, the issues of polarization is very was very, 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 very bad. Uh, because as I mentioned in my opening remarks, if you heard it, um, Pakata Harapan or the Alliance of Hope, we are trying to push for need-based policy 
rather than race-based policy. And because of that, all the effort we put in, people, especially the opposition at that point of time, we will try to interpret it through the lens of ethnicity and also religious. And therefore, they will try ways to interpret this policy, saying that this policy is detrimental to a particular race. This policy is detrimental to a particular religion. And therefore, actually, uh, within actually 22 months, after 22 months that uh, Alliance of Hope we became the government in Malaysia, we are basically being labelled as a anti-Malay or uh, anti-Malay government. Uh, Malay is the majority in my country. They got about 70% uh, of the population. And then we are being called as a Chinese Chinese, uh, Chinese government because DAP, we have like 42 seats in the in the government. And therefore, yes, we are a very important factor in the government. But however, uh, we do not have any intention to push for any agenda that is uh, particularly in favor of any ethnicity. However, we try to push for need-based policy. Um, but however, because of the racial and ethnicity and also religious tension, eventually, Pakatan Harapan, the Alliance of Hope Government for uh, one of the reasons that PPPM, uh, led by Gan Sri Mukhidin, the current Prime Minister in Malaysia, decided to leave Alliance of Hope and form the current government is because they said they want to form a Malay government, a Malay government. And basically, that is the perception. Therefore, when Pakatan Harapan or the Alliance of Hope for, or when we were the government, yes, we can see a very, very bad polarization happening in Malaysia. However, having said that, after the alliance, national alliance grew for about uh, one and a half year, uh, less than one and a half year, because the way they, they mismanaged the whole pandemic, they, they mismanaged the whole pandemic, and suddenly I would say people can see how incompetent this current government is, and because of that, the so-called Malay government suddenly they are no longer popular among the people. I must admit, at the very beginning of this uh, national alliance, uh, at, at the very beginning period, the current PM, Tansri Mukhidin Yassin, he was quite popular. He was quite popular. He seemed to be down to earth, uh, speaking people's language, and therefore he, he was very popular. In contrast, Dr. Mahate and also uh, my party and also uh, the Pakatan Halayapan uh, Alliance of Hope, we, we were not so popular. However, after this about uh, less than two years or less than one and a half years, because the, the pandemic was so badly managed that we have a lot with that after, after almost like five months of emergency, COVID cases did not go down, but however, it increased. After implementing full lockdown, full lockdown for more than four weeks, cases do not decrease, however, it increased again. And people, literally, they are taking their own life because of the desperate, desperate and hopelessness that they feel. We are reading this from the paper every day and also on the, on the social media. And currently, in Malaysia, we have a people movement, and it's called White Flag Movement. Meaning, people hang white flags in front of their door, in front of their house, to send a signal to the neighborhood that they are in desperate need of help. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, people would be starting sending food baskets, sending ads to those families. And, and this woman actually get traction very, 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 very fast in, 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 in Malaysia. And then we got very, very silly minister who said that uh, you should not put out, you should not put white flag. Uh, it is a sign of weakness. You should just play, continue to, to play. You have uh, another minister who said that he support this movement. Uh, but it's going to it make people more and more angry. So I would say in the coming general election, whether this race and also religious card can still be played, would, I would have a very big question mark. Because people suddenly realize that those people or those leaders who claim to be a Malay first leader might not be the suitable leader to lead the country. Those religious leaders or, or those politicians who claim to champion for, for their religion might not be the, a smart leader or the, or the capable leader to lead the nation. And therefore, I think in the coming general election, it will be very, very interesting uh, because I would say the, the popularity of Muhyiddin Yassin. The last question about, uh, about discrimination, and then I will go on to my final uh, remarks. Uh, in the, well, the question has to do with uh, discrimination, othering, and polarization. Uh, uh, well, in the case of the Philippines, uh, at this point, the, the polarization is not so much ethnic-based. Uh, it's more uh, based on politics, 
basically Filipinos are divided now between the pro Dutertes and the anti Dutertes. And Duterte is really quite still quite popular. And I, for one, and uh, basically the Filipinos in this forum are not side are, are not on that side. No. Nevertheless, we also need to understand the reason why uh, Filipinos are sort of attracted to to authoritarian rule, and that may be partly because of the limitations and deficiencies of the liberal, liberal democracy or liberal democratic model that uh, has not really sufficiently addressed the needs of the people. That's why sometimes they are forced to embrace the more drastic measures or those who give empty promises uh, from uh, authoritarian leaders. So that is the current uh, polarization that we have in the Philippines. In terms of discrimination, I don't think we have that now, but we, we did have, we do have a history of discrimination against the Muslims of the South, which is actually the reason why there was this uh, Muslim rebellion. The, our Muslim brothers and sisters have been victims of historical injustice in terms of discrimination, that's one, and to dispossession of land. And those went hand in hand. The discrimination was so severe, in fact, that uh, private armies were organized in order to attack, torture, and kill the Muslims, which is the main reason why they have banded together and formed the Moro National Liberation Front at the beginning and later on the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. There is an entire history about that. And uh, of, uh, of course, there's no time to elaborate, but that's uh, the most concrete expression of uh, his history of discrimination in the Philippines. Uh, well, uh, as a, in my final remarks, I don't think I have uh, anything substantial to add further from those that I have presented earlier, but I do hope that uh, this had been a learning experience. I have learned a lot from my co-speakers and I uh, did a good job at threading them all together and synthesizing them. And uh, I look forward to similar engagements uh, of, of this educational nature. So thank you, Paeng. Thanks to Progressive Alliance and to all the speakers and the organizers. Thank you. To participate in these meetings. Um, now I will not only repeat what we heard today, but I will also try to set it into some context because we were already uh, able to participate in other meetings of this kind as well in other regions of the world. Um, and there were a few things that um, struck me as particularly important throughout these meetings. So I think one um, very important um, insight we got today and in other meetings as well is that resilient democracies, especially from a social democratic perspective, perspective are not only about democratic processes themselves, but also have a strong component of social empowerment. This might strike several people as um, trivial, but it is not across the world and for many uh, groups. Um, trust and understanding of the people, and this is something that we heard today as well, is key. Um, and it is being eroded by authoritarians, uh, which is a very interesting strategy of authoritarians to turn the people against democracy, the measure that should in theory, empower people. So the message to social democrats is clear. Uh, we need to involve, inform, and empower the people. Um, this does not mean that resilient democracies and the weight of them is only on the shoulders of the people themselves, but also um, on the shoulders of parliaments and governments uh, who are already in power, because we do have many countries across the world where we have democratic forces in power, but they might be increasingly eroded as well. Um, so these have to deliver and to be stable also when in government and to actually keep a stable government running. Um, so institutions need to be functional, but this does not only uh, imply that they have to be at national level, but also internationally. And this might be the greatest challenge that social democrats have ahead of them. Um, this also implies that we should not be afraid of change. Um, we need a more functional global cooperation. Uh, and we also need to look at our democracies that we already have and think about new elements, introducing new elements such as participatory democracy, or also deliberative uh, democracy to make democracy more future proof. 
Furthermore, um, actors that are involved, and this is quite interesting in the direct comparison, are diverse um, across the world. So we see that um, democracies are being eroded by right-wing populists, but also by neoliberal forces, which sometimes play into each other. Interestingly enough, in other countries, we also saw that actors like churches sometimes tend to erode democracies, but not everywhere, just in specific contexts. And today, and there was a clear emphasis on this today, the military also plays a role. And we need to be aware if we want to foster functional international cooperation, that actors that are involved in other regions of the world might differ from the ones that we perceive uh, in our area of the world. COVID-19, of course, is also an important factor, um, and it's both a risk and a chance. It is a risk to democracies if democracies do not perform, but it is also a chance to make transparent that authoritarian actors might not be the most efficient way to deal with crises like these. So in the end, this leads us to um, a guiding question. The question, how can we find a new model to make people who are left behind profit from globalization so that they actually want to support democracy. Um, and this leads us to a huge challenge, namely to the challenge of a transformative vision. We need to deliver this transformative vision. Um, and this also implies, and this will be tricky, especially from a European perspective, this means that resilience is not only conserving a functional status quo, but that resilience also perhaps even most and foremost, means embracing change, means embracing transformative change. The question, and this is how I will round out my remarks, that we have to ponder upon, though, is that we are faced with a tension here. Today, we heard several times that international intervention, at least to a certain degree, might be necessary in the right circumstances. However, this creates a tension with intervention in the wrong circumstances, because the past showed us that international intervention that is wrong-spirited or even just right-spirited, but with the wrong measures might be very harmful. So the question is, how do we prevent justifying wrong interventions by accident? And therefore, how can we um, foster more international cooperation and a more functional international order without delegitimizing the national dem democratic orders that we already have? In other words, would an attempt to protect democracies through international intervention, uh, would this uh, run the risk of eroding democratic legitimacy where it's already given? This is just something to think about uh, for the rest of the day and for the coming weeks. And I thank you again uh, cordially for all of you. Perfect. And with that, we welcome to give his uh, closing remarks, Connie Reuter, our Global Coordinator for Progressive Alliance. Connie? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? Okay, that looks good. Well, thank you to Sokte Major, to Rafaela, Makers, and all the, from the team of Sokte Major for putting this in place. Thank you very much for to all the speakers uh, in this program. And I think, yeah, once again, it was a very rich one. And as Robert said, it is time for learning. And it is always, we enrich ourselves by mutual learning. And I think, uh, considering that Progressive Alliance uh, is a platform of 140 progressive political parties from the socialist and social democratic spectrum, uh, yes, before we want to go for a common global agenda, we need to work on the common understanding because situations are different from country to country, from continent to continent, but there are a lot of similarities. And I think what we see now in the series, this was the third of a series of four. We started in Latin America, we went through Africa, and now we are in Asia, and we will have a last round next week uh, in Europe on the 2nd of July at the same time as the Asian seminar, so I all invite you to join us then there. And I think it's important that we start this reflection process because sometimes, well, also social democrats tend to consider that putting a global agenda together is a matter of leaders, of our heads in governments, of our heads in international institutions, uh, and of the party leaders. Well, this is right, this is necessary, this is important if you want to promote a common agenda, but to elaborate a common agenda, this needs that we within our network, the parties, civil society, and also the trade union network, that we take the time of understanding what are the global processes. And I think, well, uh, the global processes are very clear. Uh, I would not be so negative as our friend from uh, India was, uh, but I think this is sometimes, the, the global vision is sometimes very much conditioned by the national vision. 
Yes, it is true that we are living in times of so-called illiberal democracy. Yes, it is true that right-wing populism and auto authoritarian regimes are moving on and putting their agenda on the table. Yes, it is true also that there is an international reactionary alliance. Yeah. Uh, Russia is playing a very bad role in this. Uh, also, China is not a promoter of a champion of human rights and of social progress. But nevertheless, uh, I think, well, we see that the, the times of crisis have been also uh, been a time of reconsidering where is the progressive and social democratic momentum. We see that around the world, we consider again how important is how important are public health and care services. The access to vaccine is a matter of global equality and not only in terms of foreign policies. On one hand, you have the, the protectionism in the North yeah, where only the products from the North are considered being relevant. On the other side, you have China and Russia well, helping many countries, uh, objectively helping many countries that would not have any vaccine if they would not get it. We have other countries like Cuba developing a very efficient vaccine, but for global policies and because of the boycott of the US, it is still difficult and the benefit of this fantastic vaccine is not getting to everyone. So nobody will be safe until everybody is safe. And I think we should use this phrase much more also than only in terms of the pandemic. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe in the Philippines, in Thailand and elsewhere, yeah, in Myanmar. And we should not be considering that in Latin America or Asia or in Europe or Africa that we have to solve the problems from our country. It's a global trend. We need to find and develop solutions, but it's a global trend and we need to come back to something which are the roots. So the idea of putting the issue of resilient democracies on the table, and I want to thank very much Robert for giving his uh, six uh, well, ingredients of resilient democracy human rights, uh, participatory democracy, democracy, accountability of uh, democratic institutions, the economic progress, uh, the social services, and uh, the, well, the question of uh, humanitarian development, empowerment, as others say. I think this is really important. And we certainly will see next week with the European seminar where we will have Professor Wolfgang Merkel uh, giving his definition of uh, resilient democracy, certainly that will be very, very similar. And this shows that we are still a global movement and that social democracy is not an export product from the North to the South, that social democracy is a vivient and uh, well vibrant uh, movement all around uh, the globe. The, well, where have, do we have to go to? And I think the, the outlook for sure, we will have this seminar in Europe next week and we will make conclusions and thanks to Dominic and the others from the Young Academic Networks of FEPS and the support of the Ebert Foundation, we will come to a, a paper that we want to publish and have a, a discussion reference, which seems to be, well, from my understanding, which is very important. We have to come back on this question of, yeah, how to counter a liberal democracy, which is popular which is popular in many countries. What can be the alternative for social democrats? It's not, it's not enough to denounce you know, human rights violations. We need to get back the public opinion with us. And this has to do very much with credibility of political action. And unfortunately in a way, which is positive, but unfortunately also in the way of understanding social democrats and progressives are much more judged on the question of credibility of the action than conservatives are or then authoritarian leaders are. So this is where can we build on? And perhaps also we have to reconsider that political messaging for parties is not sufficient. It is much more also to anchor the referent ideas in the societies and to work on this. You cannot send a message if you do not have a recipient. Yeah? Um, and well, let's take the, if we speak on solidarity, but you have a, a divided country, a divided society, that solidarity is not a reference to whom to speak to. To whom can we address? How can we convince? And in this understanding, for me, it is very clear that we need to, to rebuild also resilient democracies, in the, which means that we have to empower people. And as our friends from Ebert Foundation always quote Friedrich Ebert, the reference, for democracy, you need Democrats. And I think this is the question of empowerment to show the, that the support to democracy depends very much in how much, how in which way people buy in, in our concept in our, and that they see that the democracy is the best way to find solution, not the immediate ones. We are not the pizza delivery where you can deliver policies. We have to develop policies and solutions 
needs some time consensus and this needs time and sometimes it's a not evident process. Let me also remind that uh, perhaps it is important for us to study a little bit also the theory background. Um, when I was young activist and student for us, well, yeah, I'm German, everybody was reading, well, on the progressive and left side, everybody was reading a book from Wilhelm Reich on the mass psychology of fascism. And I think if you want to understand you know, the reference of why authoritarian regimes are popular, how do they function, how do they work? I think if you read Wilhelm Reich, who gave the example of the popularity of the National Socialists, the Nazis in Germany, I think we will find a lot of communities and unfortunately, time is not coming back, but we can learn out of history. I think also, and Dominic mentioned, there are some, some elements which we do not always integrate enough in our policy making and consideration. We heard it uh, from, uh, in particular in Latin America, uh, the question of the role also of the organized crime and narco traffickers uh, with their role in politics. Last example, elections in Mexico, but also others. Um, we heard here today on the question of the importance of military and the links to business. Uh, you can go also to Egypt, you will see very similar things. And in particular, well, we as social democrats have an idea of redistribution of wealth, which is not corruption, but corruption is very much present. And so therefore this question of how to buy majorities and how to buy democracy, uh, there was a book published, I think in 2002 in the United States, the best democracy you can buy, United States of America. Well, we saw with Biden that fortunate enough, you cannot buy all the time. But I think this is also something which needs to be uh, integrated. Last but not least, um, let me say that multilateralism was mentioned. We have been working with uh, FEBS uh, last year on this uh, statement for a new fair and inclusive multilateralism. The only problem is uh, if you have fantastic resolutions and fantastic statements and publications and nobody works with them, then you get a little bit lost. But the good news is that we have Antonio Guterres re-elected as Secretary General of the United Nations. We have a progressive government, surprisingly progressive government in the United States. We have some progress in some countries around the world, not only in Europe. And I think this could give us the, should give us the energy and should give us the motivation also to continue this reflection, which is absolutely necessary. So thanks to all and uh, yeah, good work, exciting conference. Yeah, and let's, let's continue. This is not the end, yeah? uh, but this is the beginning of something. And I think, well, if we understand that Progressive Alliance is a working platform, Let's continue, let's work together. There's a famous song from Kenneth Heath. Some of you may remember. They sang all reading Woodstock with us. Let's work together. If you don't know it, listen to it. You will get the energy out, out of this song and this will help for the next days and months to come. So thank you very much. Looking forward to continuing working with you and hopefully, hopefully meeting you again as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Pony, for giving a hopeful closing remarks. Uh, indeed, the challenges for us social democrats are many, but and this is part of also learning and studying as well, so that we can have a more relevant response to the challenges of today. Um, at this point, we of course want to thank our guests on behalf of the Progressive Alliance of Them Asia, Global Progressive Forum, Foundation for European. Uh, progressive studies, and of course from Akbayan, we thank everyone and we invite you to look at this um, uh, live uh, drawing or live scribe, um, which was drawn by one of our guests here to capture our uh, discussion. Um, so Bea is projecting it. We will be giving this um, live scribe to you also as a, our souvenir for this webinar. So with that, we thank everyone. And again, on behalf of the organizing uh, organizations uh, and groups and team, we invite everyone. Let's build together resilient democracies. Have a good afternoon, morning, evening to everyone.